Hello again, everyone. This is Ron Sparkman of OpportunityU.com, and today we're talking with an amazing individual, Dr. David Grinspoon, astrobiologist, musician extraordinaire, and author of the upcoming book, Earth and Human Hands. So we've got a lot to talk about today, so let's bring on our guest. David, how are you? I'm fine, Ron. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. I'm glad to talk to you today. you got so much going on. I was uh, glad to get a little bit of your time. Oh, it's great. It's really uh, fun for me to have this opportunity to talk to you and, and, and your millions of uh, followers. <laughs> for the millions watching at home. <laughs> so uh, first up, uh, for those that don't know, can you actually tell us what an astrobiologist is or what, uh, what astrobiology is? And uh, what inspired you to get into this specific uh, space science? So astrobiology is, um, as it sounds, a sort of hybrid of astronomy and biology. And it's basically the scientific study of life in the universe. And, um, it, you know, it's something that became possible really in the last 50 years when we started exploring the other planets. And we realized that some of them might uh, have niches for life. And we needed to broaden our study of biology to uh, consider environments beyond this planet. And so, you know, what scientist is trained to think about extraterrestrial life? A bi traditional biologists aren't really. Astronomers aren't really trained to think about that. So you need a hybrid. And uh, so it was really born um, in the last couple of decades by <clears throat> when some, um, some scientists started doing this sort of interdisciplinary study of, uh, of the possibility of alien life. And it, it involves a lot of study of the history of, of life on Earth and trying to, trying to figure out sort of what are potentially the universal requirements and limits of life, and then combining that with our, our study of and our increasing understanding of other planets, both in our own solar system and now starting to learn about the exoplanets, and sort of map that, map that together, what we know about the conditions for life based on, uh, based on the uh, history and nature of life on Earth, and what we're starting to learn about other planets, trying to put all that together to say, uh, okay, what can we say scientifically about the potential for life in the wider universe? That, that's astrobiology. That's awesome. And what, uh, what inspired you to get into that side? A lot of people kind of, you know, start with, you know, astronomy or biology, and you decided to say, hey, man, both of these together really inspire me. So what, uh, what got you to, to go in that direction? Well, I mean, you know, the first thing is, as a kid, I was, uh, from a very young age, I was definitely a space geek. Um, yeah. I was in the fourth grade when uh, when Apollo 11 happened, you know, and I, one, literally one of my earliest vivid memories is of uh, my parents letting me stay up really late and watching on this sort of scratchy black and white TV image, watching these guys step, step off the lunar lander in these sort of ghostly images that were sort of seared into everyone's brains. And that, that was just the most exciting thing. People were walking on another world. And, you know, I was like, um, you know, nine-year-old kid then. And then um, I think probably largely inspired by that, I got really into science fiction and, um, you know, I was really um, captivated by the early interplanetary missions, the first Mars missions, the first Venus missions, all that stuff was happening when I was a teenager. The first landing on Venus was when I was 15. The first landing on Mars was, uh, you know, when I was 16. And um, so it just, I, I don't know, I, did, I, I don't think there was ever another path for me. I, I was, I was going to get into the space thing. And then um, I, I was definitely exposed to um, some people well, like Carl Sagan was, was a big influence. And he, before there was astrobiology, there was exobiology. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, before there was astrobiology, there was exobiology. And it was sort of more of a fringe thing then. And, and Sagan and a few other people were saying, hey, let's, you know, let's think about the science of life elsewhere. And it, it wasn't as mainstream. A lot of the mainstream space scientists were like, well, we shouldn't really, you know, that's not respectable. We should be worrying about rocks and, and gases. And uh, Sagan and some, a few other people were saying, well, yeah, rocks and gases, that's, it's really cool. But what about, what if something's crawling in those rocks or breathing those gases? We should figure that out too. And so, so I was exposed to people that were starting to think about that, uh, I think at the right time. And then when I went to grad school, it was pretty much planetary science that I was studying, but people were just starting to get, really get into astrobiology. And then when I became a professional scientist, um, you know, really in the 90s, that happened to be when astrobiology was really taking off as something that you could, you know, you could call yourself an astrobiologist. And NASA was giving out grants for astrobiology. So it was really kind of coming into its own as something you could do 
and B, right at the time when I was starting, you know, my real post school, my real career. So my, I guess my timing was good for it. That sounds uh, that sounds amazing, and it's cool to see that you were you were really around for the birth of it. And uh, you know that's something that really Sagan talked about a lot. And you, especially in Contact, I mean, the movie and the book, uh, you know, people were kind of like SETI, like I don't know about that. But you want to search for extraterrestrial life, and we're all used to the little green men, and most people don't think about it, like you know um, those uh, those microorganisms, those tiny things that could be out there. Even that alone, if we find a few of those things, could really blow people away. So it's great to see somebody that was really at the forefront of that and uh you mentioned that you worked with uh with carl sagan i've seen some really cool pictures of you on facebook with him so um so uh, so many people have been inspired by his work and now uh you as well so can you tell us a bit what it was like to work with him and how that influenced you to be the great uh, the great science communicator that you are today well it, it was really exciting to work with him um and uh you know he was a very uh, good mentor boss teacher i i I would work summers in his lab at Cornell, where he had this really cool lab where he uh, and some other people were um, like mixing together gases and sparking them in different ways to like simulate the early conditions of Earth or simulate the conditions of Titan and say, well, let's let's put this together, this hydrogen and this nitrogen and spark it and then see what comes out, you know, and all these like, it was very much looked like a mad scientist lab with all these bubbling tubes and gas chambers and everything and spark chambers and um, so it was a, it was a cool environment to learn, and uh, he was also very, um, you know, just as his public persona was very inspiring. I would say in private he was even that much more sparkling, and you know, just crackling with ideas and wanting to talk about stuff and giving you stuff to read. He was into science fiction too. He gave me some. Uh, he would say like, read this short story by Theodore Sturgeon, you know, because it relates to to the origin of life. There was a story he loved called. Uh, you should check it out, called Microcosmic God by Theodore Sturgeon. Okay, absolutely. Which is about this this um, maverick scientist who invents life in his laboratory, you know, and then all kinds of crazy stuff happens. So we, there we are in the daytime, you know, working in his lab trying to, like, simulate the origin of life, and then at nighttime he's saying, hey, read this science fiction story about the origin of life, you know, so it was all... It was all really very inspiring and, and exciting, and I, you know, I feel very privileged to have uh, been exposed to that at, uh, you know, at a young age, for sure. And that, that I can't even imagine being in the room with him, and especially I think the most uh, the most wonderful things that I saw whenever I first watched uh, the original Cosmos, and seeing him just with the kids and the way that he was, and the way that he that he taught and he loved to teach, and he was really big about uh, teaching the lower astronomy classes whenever he was in colleges. He really wanted to give you, no matter how much how serious his work got, he wanted to make sure he could get people, you know, on the lower end of it and tell them, hey, listen, this is this is what makes it so exciting and and amazing, and uh, other than uh, talking about the people that watch on the moon, you know, Buzz and Neil, the next person that it seems like most everybody in the space sciences has been inspired by is Carl Sagan. So it's you, you and Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, and many, many others were inspired by, by what it was he did to uh, be able to take these big, amazing things and put them poetically even uh, to really kind of catch people's attention. And I love that. And it's something that you've definitely carried on. Uh, I know that you have been a frequent guest on Star Talk uh, for some time now, and now you're actually one of the uh, the guest hosts uh, for Star Talk All Stars. So can you tell us a little bit about this new spinoff project? Uh, that's actually how we met a little bit earlier this year and what your part in it is. Well, as you know, Star Talk is this uh, really uh, wonderful show that that uh, Neil has been doing uh, for for several years now, and um, he, I think he, you know he he hit on a really great formula, which is to combine uh, intelligent science talk, not superficial science talk. Really, I think pretty intelligent science talk, but to combine it with humor and pop culture, so it keeps it light, it keeps it fun, but then there's also some some depth to it, you know. So I think it's I think Star Talk's a really good formula. And then I think at a certain point um, last year, Neil just decided, hey, you know, I've got all these regular guests, some of whom are, you know, are pretty good at this. Um, and there's so much good uh, material we could be doing here. Uh, he is a busy guy. He doesn't have time to, you know, he only has time to do so much. And I think actually part of that maybe came out of the fact that when he was, um, filming the new Cosmos, 
speaking of Sagan, the new Cosmos, the, mm -hmm. the Neil film, uh, he had to be away for a while, and so he had some guest hosts, some guest hosts come in and take over for him and sort of run the show a little bit while he was gone. And I was one of those guest hosts. That was before Star Talk All Stars, just sitting in for Neil. And and he had a few other people do that. And I think maybe he, uh, I'm just guessing now. We heard some of those shows and saw some of those shows, and he's like, you know, some of these guys are pretty good at this. They can do this. And so he got this idea for uh, Star Talk All Stars, where he very generously invited a handful of us to um, basically occasionally take over as host. And uh, so it's it's kind of Neil deGrasse Tyson's star talk where Neil isn't always there. Uh, and we love it when he's there, but we also love being able to, to uh, carry on in his absence and do it. it. It's a great opportunity for me. And I think it's it's pretty much the same formula as uh, star talk, but uh, I think there is license to try some new things. and. Um, you know, a big part of it also is Chuck Nice, who's been a regular on Star Talk, and Chuck is really a very creative guy. And so when we filmed our first few um, Star Talk All Star episodes, he said, "Hey, let's try some new stuff. Let's do some little comedy segments and um, film some just some wacky little filler segments. You know, trying some new formulas." And he, uh, Chuck, and and the other, the other people doing the show have this real kind of anything goes attitude which is really fun for me because they said, yeah, whatever you want to come up with, let's try it. So uh, I, I need to take more advantage of that. I need to go back and record some more episodes. The ones I've done so far have been a blast. Um, so it's just a matter of coming up with the, the um, topics and, and the guests. But, but they seem really open to experimentation. If you say, hey, hey Chuck, let's try this, this comedy skit, he'll, he'll be like, yeah, let's go for it. And, and, you know, we did a couple of songs on the uh, – on, on the episodes that I, the, the sort of premiere episodes that I take. And that was Chuck's idea, and it was great. Chuck said, hey, I want you to do an Astrobiology Blues, and here's some ideas for some lyrics. He sent them to me, and then I, I took that and ran with it and, and sort of wrote the rest of the song, and, and we did it. So I love that. You know, I love that, that uh, Neil and Chuck are, are uh, so creative and so open to trying new things. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about it as an opportunity just to keep, keep um, you know, trying things and seeing what works. And it's, uh, it really is a brilliant idea. And speaking of Astrobiology Blues, uh, I believe that is the most popular YouTube video I have was uh, the recording that I did at All Stars of, of you guys doing that. And you I'm can okay. just hear the, yeah, the, the room full of people. One of my friends shared it on Reddit, and it's got like 10,000 views now. <laughs> like everybody, everybody, oh, cool. Yeah, everybody wow, was, watched it. It was really fun. <laughs> you know, it helped that we were uh, we had a few, uh, uh, shall, I say, shall I say, sips of that um, – that uh, what was that beer that had been in the yeast had been in orbit? And, yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Um, and, uh, so that control. helped. I think it was and then here I am sitting at this table with Neil and you know astronaut Mike and Chuck, and we're we're jamming out on a song. I'm like, wow, this is cool. And it was, and then it's like, oh, by the way, they're filming this. It wasn't even, you know, what you weren't even that aware that it was even all being filmed, and that you know, I'm glad, I'm glad it got captured. <laughs> And it was it was just an electric atmosphere too. It was you and Jen Eleven and Mike Massimino, and there's all these really amazing personalities that uh, you know Neil and his crew have attracted. And uh, I especially loved when you guys did uh, Moon Dance too. Uh, Stacy yeah. Everett, the community manager for uh, Star Talk, uh, she was amazing. She's just you know killing it. She hops in with her flute and she's yeah, Stacy. Stacy nailed that on the flute. And she really did. She's, that she's was funny. I never thought I'd be um, <laughs> be sitting there singing moon dance with you know with Neil and Chuck and and Mike all these people. It was a riot. It really was, and it made it. And it was so amazing for us, um, you know, for for the people watching. If you don't know about it, Patreon is this very cool thing that allows you to interact with these creators, and they have their own. Uh, they have a, a tier for Star Talk, and you can uh, go backstage. You can uh, you know go to these holiday parties, and they have all these things going on. So the first major party was the Star Talk All Stars, and so it was really cool to be you know, me and some of the other regular people that got to sit and talk to these people that we've been listening to for years, or people that we follow. As me, as uh, you know, I'm an aspire. Uh, astrophysicist, you know, many years in the future from now, but uh, just to be surrounded by these people and they're just as amazing in person. And it was it was really uh, an incredible experience, and it was cool that everybody felt that way. You know, everybody had a beer, and we're all taking pictures and talking about just these completely random things. And it humanizes these people that a lot of us, you know, look up to, like yourself, you know, Neil, Bill, Mike, and uh, it, it was really uh, it was an incredible incredible time. 
Um, so yeah, so these shows have been really great. And of course, you know, your, your main topic is astrobiology. So it's, uh, one of the most fascinating things that we can talk about right now. Uh, the biggest goal in space science really for so many of us is proving life. I talked to the director of NASA astrophysics a few weeks ago and nearly everything comes to where are we going to find life? And, you know, are we going to find it on Mars? Are we going to find it in Europa? All these different, uh, interesting ideas. So where is your favorite candidate to find life in the solar system or even beyond it? It, and what do you think it's really going to mean for humanity once we finally prove life elsewhere? How is that going to change us? Yeah, well, I mean, it is an exciting time because, um, like you say, everybody's kind of excited about it in different ways, everybody involved in space exploration. And the reason is, I mean, it's an age-old question, of course, are we alone in the universe? What, you know, are we something unique or are we just one example of something that's happening all over the universe? But what's amazing about our time right now is that it seems not implausible that we could answer this question sometime, you know, in the next decade or, or two. And, you know, people might think that at any time, but the fact is right now we're, we're expanding our knowledge so fast and we've just learned that the exoplanets are planets and we're just starting to learn what they're like. And over the next couple of decades, it's going to be like, beep, 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 beep. all these question marks are going to be turning into data. And we're going to know. And so if there are a bunch of occupied planets out there, which there could be, then in that time period, that's when we'll find out. You know, so it's, it's very exciting. At the same time, we're sending spacecraft around the solar system. As far as my favorite place to find life or, or what I think is the most promising, the first thing I'd say is I think it's dangerous to have too much of a favorite because we're so ignorant about life. Uh, we know nothing. We have this one example on Earth. We have some hunches about elsewhere. But I think it's very important for us to ex explore broadly and keep our blinders wide open and not have a too fixed an idea about, oh, it's going to be here and it's going to be doing this and it's going to be just like this because we'll probably be wrong. So we have to be very broad in our outlook. But, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not optimistic about finding life on Mars today. I think Mars is a great place to look for fossils. I think that the potential for life on Mars is mostly in the past when it was a much more Earth-like fertile place with, you know, probably oceans and definitely running rivers and lakes and rainfall. I mean, there could be life on Mars today, and I support everything we're doing, and it would be... <coughs> Sorry, it's tough. I grab a sip of tea. Oh, it's just fine, and no, absolutely. You know, it's, it does. It's not. It's definitely not conducive to anything exciting right now. <laughs> well, I mean, it could be. It's like there's, there's, there are these underground niches on Mars, and I, I totally support the the search. And if you know, there are these whiffs of methane. Maybe that methane is a gas coming from some underground aquifer where there's some creatures. So we got to keep doing what we're doing. But my hunch is that a planet like Mars, which is pretty much geologically dead today. I mean, in terms of internally generated activity, tectonics, and volcanism, it's pretty dead. Most of the geology on Mars now is kicked around by the sun, the atmosphere, but the rocks are pretty dead. So my sense is that a planet like that doesn't have a lot of life. I, I see life on a planet as related to the amount of geological activity. That's why I think life like Earth is so rich with life, not just because we have the right climate, but because Earth is such an active planet geologically, and that creates these geochemical cycles which feed the biosphere with nutrients and energy. So, um, so Mars isn't my first choice, but there are other, parts, other places in the solar system, like Europa, for instance, does have that active core that's being fed by tidal forces and has a liquid water ocean, and maybe, you know, there could be life on Europa. We definitely have to check that out. And likewise, Titan and Enceladus, uh, moons of Saturn, are places where there's definitely activity going on and interesting chemistry and liquid water at depth. And then on Titan, you have liquid methane, which who knows, could be a source of some other kind of life. Any place with interesting <coughs> geological and chemical activity, I think is worth looking, as that's the kind of place where life could have found a toehold and evolved something. So to me, the more active the world, especially if there's liquids where something could be, um, you know, liquid seems like a good thing for life as far as cellular um, materials and, and the kind of chemistry you need. So I'm excited about Titan. I'm excited about Enceladus and Europa. And then there are these long shot places like there's, you know, there's an ocean inside of Pluto, it looks like. Who knows? It's going to be a while before we go ice fishing on Pluto. But 
Uh, one of the these fact days, that we can go ice fishing on Pluto is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of these days we've got to do it. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> tell, tell your tell your buddy Elon. I noticed you got the SpaceX hat there. <laughs> if you wanted to go ice fishing on Pluto, you know he might be able to pull it off. Well, that's that's the goal with ITS. I think you know everybody sat with uh, bated breath, and obviously there's a lot of details to to get to get to but i mean mars just the way that he says it, he this is a, a guy that has continuously come up with these amazing ideas and then continues to eventually pull them off and even he makes fun of the fact that you know it's like all right i've got a, i've got a time frame i don't always hit it but i always get i always do what i say i'm going to do so yeah. um i think that's the most exciting part is you know uh to get to mars be on mars and to be able to launch off to go to europa and uh, see what, you know, might be there. And you mentioned Titan. Um, Cosmos, uh, the new Cosmos was actually what inspired me. I, uh, I was a DJ for years before that. I had no interest in space science whatsoever. My, my science love when I was younger was paleontology. That's what I wanted to go to school for before DJing happened. And watching that very first episode of the new Cosmos, and whenever he talk, uh, starts talking about Titan, and um, you have the Saturnian moon that – has methane lakes, and it's like, what could be swimming there? For the first time, I really thought that, wow, the idea of alien life is actually absolutely plausible, and it's, prob oh, yeah. it's probably everywhere. You know, the only thing I ever thought of was ID4. You know, I would thought of these great things, but it put it into a way that excited me. It's just, you know, there could be microbial life on Mars. Europa is probably, you know, one of my favorite spots, but finding out that now there's an ocean underneath, you know, the heart on Pluto – it's mind blowing. It seems like it could be anywhere. And then there's just, those are just the ways that we think we know. Uh, you go back and watch the old cosmos and Carl talks about the idea of uh, Venusian life and uh, what it yeah. could be like there. Well, and that's, my, that, that's also one of my favorite sort of sleeper ideas is uh, life in the clouds of Venus. Uh, I actually yeah. wrote, wrote a couple papers about that. It's not that I think there's life on Venus. Um, if I had to bet, I'd say there probably isn't, but I don't think we can entirely rule it out because even though the surface is, hellacious, way too hot, completely dry. Up in the clouds, you know, 50 miles up from the surface, there's this huge, thick cloud deck that is an aqueous environment, that is a water-rich environment. Sure, it's concentrated sulfuric acid, um, which you and I wouldn't like, Yeah. but there are microbes that, that can exist in sulfuric acid. And there's energy sources up there, and there's nutrients. And so who knows? You know, that's one of the kinds of environments that makes me go like, well, you know, we can't rule it out until we explore it. Yeah, what's, what's sulfuric acid, acidic life like? I don't even know if that's weird. You know, what's methane-based life going to be like? What, what could those things be? And uh, then it just opens up to it could be anywhere. And now we know there's, you know, as, 10 times as many uh, galaxies out there as we thought there was. We thought there was going to be hundreds of billions. Now there's trillions. You know, the, just the possibilities just are mind blowing right now. But yeah, as we all know, there are a lot of places out there, you know, there's a lot of room for uh, natural experiments to be running on different worlds. And so even if life is very rare on any given world, it doesn't matter. There's still so many places that something's going to be happening somewhere. Yeah, and it's it's a mind blowing time to be alive. And uh, but um, as as you know, Carl uh, said quite a few times, uh, we we can't get anywhere else yet. And so right now, the only place that we have is our own. And uh, that brings us to uh, the biggest thing that you have going on right now, which I really can't wait for this, just because of the reviews that I've read about it. But you have a new book coming out in the next few months called Earth in Human Hands, and the reviews are amazing. I'll just read a couple of them. Uh, in his wonderful writing style, Dr. Grinspoon spells it out. A single species is inducing more profound changes to our planet than any other organism in geologic history. It's us. If you have family and friends here on Earth, read this book. The Earth is in our hands. Bill Nye. Uh, if Carl Sagan were alive today, this is the book he would write. Daily Cost. What? That's awesome. And a beautiful and detailed overview of the way we must change our thinking if we truly understand uh, the transformation in our mist. So it sounds exactly like the type of book that we re that we need right now to inspire change in people. So can you tell us a little bit about it, what inspired it, and uh, maybe even release dates, that kind of thing? Sure, yeah, well that's, that's really uh, wonderful um, praise to get from those people that I really respect, and so I, I hope I've, I've earned it. Actually, let me just grab off the shelf here. Um, this is uh, a pre-publication copy, but it's going to look like this, Earth in Human Hands. That's my signed copy, right? Um, yes. That's, well, no, because see, this is uh, not for sale coming in December in the fine print. But I've actually, 
I just heard from my publisher that they've just got the printed actual book. So I'm going to get one in the mail probably like tomorrow. So I'm pretty excited. But um, it's uh, – the book basically came about from my um, interest in applying astrobiology to us. In other words, a lot of people have a consternation right now about our future and what we're doing with this planet, as they should. Anybody who's paying attention realizes that we're in uncharted territory here. Uh, with the changes we're inducing in this planet. And uh, how are we going to handle that? We're supposedly an intelligent species, right? I mean, that's what, you know, we're looking supposedly. We're going steady. We're searching for other intelligent species with our radio uh, antennas, which is great. But then that implies that we're an intelligent species if we're searching for other ones. But if we're an intelligent species, why are we in a situation where we're changing our planet and we're not sure we can handle the consequences of that? That doesn't seem intelligent, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, <laughs> um, basically, I uh, decided to take um, a sort of deep time and deep space view of the human situation right now. Um, I, uh, I did this project. I started at the Library of Congress. I got this really cool gig at the Library of Congress. called it, They have this new position called Chair of Astrobiology, which is uh, they want people to go there for a year and do some study that relates astrobiology to other humanistic questions. And so I wrote a proposal. I said, I want to study the astrobiology of the Anthropocene Epoch. The Anthropocene is the name that geologists are giving now to our new era of geologic history. In other words, you've got, time, you've got the Jurassic, the Triassic, the whatever. Um, supposedly we're in the, you know, the Pleistocene now, except for there's this whole new geologic force that's changing the planet. Us. It's humanity. Yeah. And so some geologists have now said, let's rename the period we're in to acknowledge this new force, and let's call it the Anthropocene, because Anthropos, the time of humans. It's kind of a controversial idea. But I said, okay, well, let's see how that looks from an astrobiology point of view. And I said, let's look at the whole history of the planet, all the big changes that have happened, not every detail, but what are the major transformations, you know, the origin of life, uh, the origin of complex life, the, you know, the, the, the rise of oxygen, the sort of big few major changes and then I said well what's happening to the planet now if you were an alien looking at our planet you would and you say you have been looking at our planet for billions of years and then all of a sudden you'd see whoa what's happening now it's lighting up at night mm -hmm. the atmosphere is changing the land surface is changing there's little spacecraft starting to launch off the planet and buzz around into space there's something completely new going on in this planet you know so I wanted to capture that from that kind of almost extraterrestrial perspective what's happening to earth now and then how does that deep time perspective on ourselves maybe help us think about our role on the planet and our future and i think i actually succeeded in in giving a kind of optimistic take on the potential for humanity not trying to gloss over the problems we've got now and the challenges because we do have some challenges about how we're going to manage ourselves on this planet with you know 10 11 billion people and and not really mess up the natural systems that we depend upon. But I also think that in the long run, we've got um, huge potential to, um, to really uh, actually sort of alter our behavior so that we're playing a constructive role on the earth and not a destructive role. And that we can actually save species and save ourselves and prevent that next asteroid from hitting the earth that otherwise would have wiped out life. And ultimately pre prevent the next ice age because there are natural, natural things that happen to the earth that are not good for life. Mm -hmm. so, so first we got to get a handle on our, our reckless short-term behavior, but it doesn't end there. Our responsibility and our opportunity doesn't end there. Then, then it gets good once we stop being this sort of short-term destructive um, vandal, vandalizing force on the planet. Then we get to be a constructive force on the planet and stop asteroids and stop ice ages and um, help um, species avoid extinction. So I think that in the long run, um, the human presence on Earth is going to be something to celebrate and be proud of. And that right now we're just in this, um, this tight spot because we're in an unprecedented situation. We find ourselves changing the planet and we go, whoa, what are we doing? We don't know how to run a planet. You know, we're sort of caught, we caught ourselves off guard. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think we need this deep time perspective. And so that's, uh, anyways, that, that, that's basically what I do in this book is try to give a deep time perspective on our existence here on the planet. 
And I think that's a, a, an absolutely wonderful thing. I think so, uh, so often people hear what's going on and they think that, you know, all they hear is, oh, this, it's this alarmism, uh, you know, it's an alarmist uh, point of view. And in a sense, it sort of is, but you're not going to hear anybody that isn't going to tell you that, especially, you know, scientists like yourself and Bill Nye with his book and, you know, Star Talk and Cosmos is that here's the problem, but here's how we can fix it. And here's what the world will look like. They're, they're offering, uh, there's offerings of here's how we can do this. Here's how we can do it together. It's going to take all of us. And first, everybody needs to know it. Uh, I don't know. Have you seen Leonardo DiCaprio's uh, documentary that came I out? I haven't Sunday? watched it yet, but I've been seeing a lot of people have been talking about it. it makes me, I, I definitely want to see it. Have you, have you seen it? Yes, I have. I watched it the other day, and I'm probably going to watch it again. Uh, I actually even put it up on the website. There, It's out there. You can watch it. Uh, they, I think it's actually in a couple of theaters. Uh, it's on TV. Um, you have it's, – it's on YouTube completely free. Anybody can take it and embed it. They're very serious about it. And even, uh, even Leo is uh, – I, I think um, it's another one of those things where we had to take one of the most famous faces in the world, and sometimes it takes – a celebrity saying something for a lot of regular people to pay attention. And yeah, he doesn't really do that. I mean, if somebody's got the yeah. platform for whatever reason, because they made some um, blockbuster movies or whatever, mm -hmm. if you've got that platform and people are paying attention to you, whether you deserve it or not, you ought to, uh, you know, if you have the opportunity to turn that into um, getting people to care about something that you're passionate about, I, you know, more power to them. I think that's great. It's great. It, way it, to celebrity. And it is. He took two years and he educated himself and he traveled the world. And you, uh, a lot of people have heard the the UN speech and, uh, and and him talking in front of them, but not a whole lot of people. He mentions the two years in there, but at the time I didn't realize he was filming a documentary while he was doing it. And you can see him. He uh, it 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 kind of clicks at one point the own footprint he's had on the planet being you know rich and be able to travel the world. And there's a lot to it. He does a really great job at presenting it in a way that I hope people will listen to. And uh, I think that. Between that and uh, what you're doing, you know, Bill, uh, Bill's Unstoppable book and, and start talking all these different avenues that we have to educate people and tell people what's going on. I think that we're only going to we're only going to solve these problems. It, everything's looking good. The Paris Agreement's yeah, going I'm, well. I'm yeah. hopeful. I mean, I, we, we definitely have some some challenges and there's a lot of resistance to change. And, you know, we've got our work cut out for us. But I do feel like the awareness of this is starting to spread and um, that that's the key thing actually is awareness. I feel like once there's a mass um, global awareness of our global needs and problems and the way our global actions are affecting things, that awareness empowers us to actually change our role because then it just becomes, um, you know, self-interest, like what they say call enlightened self-interest. It's not like we're suddenly going to become these perfect altruistic beings. It's more like everybody wants to save their butt <laughs> and the Absolutely. way we collectively save our butts is to change our global behavior in ways that are becoming more and more obvious. Yeah. And uh, another thing that I think is a, a, a little beacon of light is that all over Facebook, there are promotions for vote climate, like vote for people that are going to help us change climate and, right. uh, you know, make the changes that we need to make sure that we can move forward. And I think that's a, that's kind of a thing. If you, if it's really, um, prominent on Facebook, that probably means that it's starting to be a little bit more important money. People are spending, you know, advertising dollars to make sure that it gets out there. So I think it's a, I think it's a great thing. And I'm, I myself, I'm extremely excited to read the book and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the tour in just a few minutes. Uh, I will certainly be at the one in Denver, but final question really is um, for all those aspiring scientists out there, uh, what advice would you give to the people that are maybe just starting or, you know, have this dream of going into these space sciences? Uh, what did you wish that you knew coming up and uh, kind of what got you through the long nights whenever you're like, I'm done with this. Uh, I'm not, I can do no more calculus. What got you through those yeah. nights? And uh, what, what's, yeah. well, what's some of the inspiring words you would throw out to some of the people? I think the, the main thing I would say is, um, you know, go into science if you love science, if you love doing it. If you don't, there's plenty of other good ways to make a living. But, um, you know, for me, grad school was, you know, sure, there's moments of um, terror and doubt and loneliness and all those things because it's, it's years of intensity. But I would say overall, for me, grad school was really, really fun because it's a time when, yeah, it's hard and challenging, but you're basically your function is to learn all this stuff from people that really know what they're doing and whose job it is to teach you all this stuff about the universe. 
And um, you, not only that, but you've got your, you know, your comrades, your fellow students, and they're struggling too. And, yeah. you know, so I'm not going to lie and say it was all a bed of roses. There were times when it was really uh, kind of miserable. But at the same time, I look <laughs> back on it now and I think, well, that was all pretty, pretty great. Um, and so I would say, um, you know, if basically if being up late at night doing a problem set in physics or in planetary atmospheres, if that seems like torture to you, then you really ought to be doing something else. But yeah, I mean, yeah, there's aspects of torture. I'm not going to lie, but but um, <laughs> you know, okay. So there's this. Um, there's you heard about the myth of of Sisyphus, right? Classic myth of um, Greek myth of Sisyphus, where this guy's pushing a rock up a hill and pushing and pushing. And then it always comes back and like rolls back over him. And then he has to go back and, you know, he spends his life pushing this rock up a hill as some kind of punishment. And um, grad school sort of like that, except um, there, there was this uh, writer named Albert Camus mm -hmm. who wrote um, a, an existentialist um, reanalysis of the myth of Sisyphus. And he concluded that Sisyphus is actually happy because he has a purpose in life. And his purpose is pushing that rock up the hill. And as long as he has something that, you know, he's comfortable doing, even though that's what he has to keep doing, he's probably happy. And I guess I look at, um, at school that way. It's like, yeah, you're pushing a rock up the hill. But, you know, basically, if you think of what you're doing compared to all the other things you could be doing in the world, it's really not a bad deal. Uh, you're learning. It's tough, but... And if you like it, if you love learning, then keep doing it and keep going for it. Um, and uh, just get pleasure out of the struggle. Um, and if you don't, then that's a sign that you should probably, um, there's no dishonor in realizing that you don't want to do science. There's plenty of other things to do. But I think the people that are going to thrive are the people that realize, um, yeah, this is torture, but it's my torture. I choose it and I embrace it. So I guess I would say sometimes you just have to sort of embrace the torture, but um, you know, and, and keep keep your eyes on the on the bigger picture. I mean, it's like to me, being able to be part of an enterprise where you can, in some tiny way, even contribute to the increase of human knowledge about the universe, and you're in a position where you can learn things and contribute to a team that's figuring things out that nobody has ever known before about a part of the universe i mean to me that's that's just basically worth everything it's it's a wonderful feeling so i would say if that inspires you and you can put up with a you know a little bit of masochism then just yeah, then just go for it <laughs> with a little bit just just a, just a smidge of masochism you'll be a little bit of masochism that's basically part of it <laughs> well i mean at least you're honest about it and uh you know there's a lot of people you know i'm starting uh, later in my life i've got a 10 year road ahead of me I and mean, i think that the part i love about it is that um, even you know sitting in a math class you know right now i'm at uh you know i'm in a developmental math class you know uh, i College algebra will be for me next year. I've got years of uh, of math and physics ahead of me, and I'm I love it because I'm already starting to see different ways that it's going to be a part of my job. You know, I start looking at it and I see parabola and some stuff. I'm just like, oh, you know, I'm, that's that's what I want to be working with. That's gonna yeah. I know what you know, I know what that means. And that's the way to approach math. I guess I would give that advice too. Is that to me, learning math in a vacuum, where it was just this abstract thing, just these problems to solve was always kind of hard because it seemed a little bit pointless. I mean, I could see how it was cool. There are these clever sort of intellectual games, but it was very abstract. But when you're learning it because it helps you solve a problem and you start to see those connections mm -hmm. that like, you know, there's certain like those exponential functions and those power law functions and certain kinds of mathematical relationships. When you start studying the physics of the universe and the chemistry of the universe, you see them over and over again and you go, oh, wow, this math is sort of built into the way the universe works. And if I learn how to, all of a sudden I have this power to figure out all these things. And then it's in the service of something. It's not just abstract. It's like, wow, these are tools that really give me power. And so I think learning the math uh, and connecting it to those physical problems is a much better, for me, was much easier and, and made more sense than just learning it all by itself. And I think that's it, is that so many people aren't ever really uh, – 
they're it's they're they're not exposed to science communicators uh, like yourself and a lot of people. Uh, I'll I'll talk to people and tell people about something. They'll ask me about this certain thing or the universe. They'll ask me like, "Hey, can you explain uh, the end of Interstellar to me?" And uh, then after after we get it done, they say, "Why don't teachers sound like you?" And I said, <laughs> that, "Well, so so few of them are really um, they're not paid really that well, and they've been doing it for a lot of years, and they're really forced to do a lot of these things because of uh, you know standardized testing and all this." But when you when you have somebody like that volunteers their time, I, I volunteer at the Space Foundation. I work there, and uh, you know that time. Then you know we have the NOAA's SOS, and we get to do these big giant presentations on this thing. It really is it's something different. Like we're here to answer your questions. It doesn't matter what you want to ask us. It's not like in class where I need to make sure my students can answer these twenty specific questions, or this could mean my job. What do you want to know? Like ask me a question. Yeah. I had a little girl that asked me if there's candy in space. Yes, there is. They send some up to the International Space Station. Her eyes got as big as saucers and it totally made her day to find yeah, out that. That when I'm teaching or <laughs> almost always the part that I like the best is when I finished whatever I had prepared and I say, Are there any questions? and people come up to the microphone or raise their hands and then you start the part where it's just dialogue and people ask something and you answer and then to me that's always that's often where the magic happens you know when you're just kind of addressing people's questions well, and then and you find out what, I mean, obviously it means a lot to them. Uh, it can be frightening to stand up in front of a room full of intelligent people to ask an even more intelligent person a question about space or science or anything like that. Uh, you know, especially what if you fumble and mess up? <laughs> you know, you just make yourself look bad in front of a room full of people. So, I mean, obviously it's going to mean a lot to them. And I, and I love seeing uh, the, these interactions that you see go viral on YouTube and people are, you know, somebody's asked you a question or Bill or Neil or, you know, Jenna or all these amazing people it's this little girl that asks a question and it always ends up with just this inspiring message that really anybody can listen to and uh, I think that we can't forget that there's always going to be people of a million that there's an infinite amount of ages that you could come up with that these people are going to be inspired by this you never know when you get it's going to change somebody's life and it's amazing the work that you guys do and we uh, we greatly appreciate it and I'm so glad that we were able to have you on today and uh, before we uh, before we finish up where can people find you on social media and and uh, get details. I know you got the book tour coming up. So where can people find these details about you and order the book? Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, so uh, on social media, well, on, on Twitter, I'm Dr. Funky Spoon, D-R <laughs> Funky Spoon. Um, so that's, uh, and I, you know, put out a, a constant stream of um, all kinds of stuff, including sometimes useful information. <laughs> um, but, We're a little um, bit political, just so people know, just a... Just Sometimes, it's just just these days. I'm hoping in a couple of weeks, then I, I can get less political, you know. But, um, <laughs> but or, or in like a few days. <laughs> but, but um, there's uh, well, uh, let's see. So for the book Earth in Human Hands, uh, there's a Facebook page. It's just the Earth in Human Hands Facebook page, and that's got um, information about dates for the tour and other stuff. Um, there's, of course, you can look it up on Amazon and it's going to be on sale, um, on December 6th is, uh, the, the on sale date for, for the book. But also I've got a website, which is funkyscience.net. Um, I'm actually redoing it right now. Um, but it's, uh, generally it's got the reasonable information about my activities and other things that I'm writing and media and stuff. So yeah, between, I would say, uh, uh th there is a tour coming up in, um, December and January and February. I'm going to be going around the country, a lot of places, giving talks, doing signings and stuff. I'd love to see people come out and, 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 and meet people during that. Um, and uh, the best way to find out the dates for that is either go to the Earth and Human Hands Facebook page or go to my website, uh, funkyscience.net and you can find it all there. Excellent. And uh, for anybody that's watching, we will also drop all the info below the video so that way you guys can uh, hit the Facebook page, Twitter page, and find out any and all information. And uh, once again, David, thank you so very much for your time today. And I will certainly see you in December when you are in Denver. And uh, I look forward to that. And uh, thanks a lot. This has been really fun. This has been great. Thank you so much. All right. Take care.